Well, uh, Prasad, uh, thank you so much for uh, joining me for my project. Uh, could you just talk off, uh, start off by talking a little bit about yourself? Sure. Myself, Prasad Falke, as I said, and I'm working as a technology leader in the telecom industry right now. And I, two days ago, I started a new job, so that's why it's kind of like a little bit uh, crazy start for me. Other than that, I'm also into public speaking, space technology presentations, ham radio, and so many other productive things. And as part of that process or presentation, I think we made in one of the conferences in Texas in 2017. That was November 2017, and it was One World's Conference, I believe. So that's how we made, and that's what my goal is to be with the space leaders like you whenever I can. And one more thing I wanna highlight here is that I'm also one of the admins or moderators for the I Love Mars Facebook page, thanks to my friends Ron and Bill. And that's how I'm in, I'm in touch with the space industry and space experts. I'll have to uh, make sure I, I like that page. Um, Please do. Um, so what did surprise you that most of the people I've talked to didn't know that we we're planning to go back to the moon in 2024? I would say people still don't know our capabilities. The last time we flew to moon was in 1960s and since then we didn't have any human missions yet. And I believe that is one of the reasons people think why do we need to go to moon? But they don't understand or no offense to their feelings or their thoughts or opinions because I'm fair with everyone that probably they must be thinking about the budget and Mother Earth and everything. But on top of that, we always have to think as a backup plan. That's what I personally do. And that's what we should do, that whenever we think of Mars mission, the moon is the first stop for us. And that's why moon is very critical part for all the future human missions to us. Yeah, I've interviewed about 260 plus people. And originally I started the project by uh, interviewing people at the coffee shop at the airports on the streets, you know, random people. I was trying to get like uh, random people thing. And then of course with the lockdown, I've had to move my uh, um, interviews online, which kind of changes a little bit of the nature of the interviews, you know? Right. Um, right. But even of those, you know, family and friends and what have you, it's like, hey, when'd you find out we're going to the moon uh, in 2024? They're like, well, uh, just when you, <laughs> you told me or asked me for this, you know, interview is when I found out. Right. Um, and in fact, I had some people say, why is NASA keeping it a secret? You know, uh, or they even thought like the whole space program had been shut down, you know, because when the shuttle retired in 2011. Um, uh, and, you know, so, and, uh, you know, the way we get our news now is very different than it used to be. I have like, I, I go to news.google.com, you know, Facebook and Twitter, and like everything is specialized to what the platform thinks would interest me right. as opposed to the same stuff that everybody sees. So I see a whole bunch of space stuff. Somebody else sees no space stuff. Sure. And I was wondering if that was your observation as well. It is actually because so many friends told me that they don't see many space related news nowadays. It's just because of the algorithms that is being played, not played, but implemented by Google, Facebook, Twitter, and all the top of top networking sites. That's the reason, one of the reasons I believe. And then again, it's up to you how much you wanna get involved in the space because I'm part of Space Hipster on Facebook and the I Love Mars and all the space technology companies. So I get all my updates from those people. Even on Twitter, I'm on Twitter just because of the whole Mars mission, Moon mission and NASA, ISRO, Japan, ESA, because of those people. So that's how I get my news. And whenever I share something, my friends, my family, they come to know, Prasad, is this happening? The Venus or Mars, Jupiter, what's going on? Can you please tell us more about this? Let me tell you one interesting story. I told you just now, right? I, two days ago, I started my new job. And two months ago, I was interviewing for the same job. It's just the process is too long. But then when one of the interviewers, actually two interviewers saw the posters behind me and they asked me, Prasad, are you a fan of space? I said, yes. And they asked me, Prasad, in your resume, you also mentioned that you did your thesis on deep space network technology, which is being used by NASA. Can you tell me about this? And then I started talking about the, about the deep space network, which is the only technology which we use for solar-based 
or within the solar system as well as outside the solar system for any communication. So Voyager 1, 2, the Cassini, then Juno, Chandrayaan and everything. So not just NASA, not just US, but almost every single country who have their spacecrafts outside in the galaxy or in the solar system, they use our system, the deep space network. And I was telling them like how it is distributed, California, Spain, Australia, it is like 360 degree, 24 seven, year long communication. So you don't have to worry about your communication loss. So that's how I keep my friends, my family, my colleagues, my teammates entertained or educated all the time. So I would say they should go to your channel, your LinkedIn page or on Twitter, Facebook and start subscribing to space related pages. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. Um, you know, I mean, it's about creating content that is not space uh, focused, but has right. little like space um, uh, links in it, you know, I mean, so like an article about uh, networking over large distances, you know, and it's like talking about, uh, uh, you know, satellite uh, networking and, you know, fiber cable. And then it's like, well, the ultimate is like the deep space network, which is used right. to, and, um, you know, or even like, um, like the Martian movie uh, poster behind you, you know, you can have like uh, Arctic content about movie posters in general and what's the best looking one, the artistic one. And then it's like, well, this one takes scenes from uh, other things. So it's like, it's almost like we have to be uh, like guerrilla marketing in terms of getting space out there. True, 100%. Yeah. Um, so in terms of like your um, ham radio work, uh, what are some projects that you're working on now? At the moment, I was personally, I was working on smart home security application. At the same time, I was trying to integrate my Raspberry Pi with the ham radio so that I can do some local communication because I have so many great mentors within our co co uh, uh, county. I live in Phoenix, Arizona, so I have very great friends and they un encourage me all the time. So for the ham radio, I'm also part of uh, an organization called Arizona Near Space Research Organization. And we get funding from NASA. So one of the reasons for our organizations is that we promote STEM education or STEM awareness within the school communities and churches so that the kids or whoever is interested, they can come and see us. But what we do is we launch balloons in the sky. I can't say space because that doesn't specify the boundary. But I can say for some time, because our title says space, so yes, we launched balloon in the space and the maximum altitude we have achieved so far is 115,000 feet. And uh, the next project or the next launch is the next month for which I already volunteered. It's on October 24th. So what we do is we go to schools or we used to go to schools before pandemic. We will ask them for their projects, interesting projects. And it's part of ham radio again, because I'm a ham radio volunteer for them. I do communication. And we go to school, we ask them for projects so that they will see, oh, so Prasad and the ANSR organization, they are launching balloon, what can we do? So the project could, or the payload could be anything. It could be in the form of a GoPro, which is attached to a box so that it will, it will accept the impact and whatever it could be. So some, some students have made some interesting projects like they will calculating the altitude, the temperature, the, uh, the pressure and everything as the balloon was going up. So it has helped us to provide this education awareness within the students. So that is one of the projects I'm working on right now. And from the space point of view, I don't have much, but from the Raspberry Pi, from the ham radio, I'm doing so many things that I'm not able to recall everything right now. Um, are you able to maintain communication uh, with the balloon all the way up to its at the highest point and then yes. all the way back down? Yes. And we have, transporter, we have radios, multiple radios attached to the payload along with whatever data we are trying to get. And that's how we can see. So there will be somebody who will be sitting at home and he will be watching that balloon. He will tell us, okay, Prasad and team, the chase team, you will have this 
burst at this altitude and at this location and when that burst occurs then the parachute will open and it will land somewhere 30 miles from your place it could be anywhere in the desert in the private property military property so we have to take all the permissions before the hand so yes we can track it we also have transponder so because of which the flying the airplanes and all the all the things which are happening they can see our balloon because as per the FA regulation, if it is over 20 pounds, then we have to have the transponder. That's the requirement. So yes, we can track it all the way up, up and then down. Um, how many pounds is the payload? The payload is usually, it depends how many students wants to participate. Usually we allow only two payloads per balloon. And if we have more than two, then we launch two different balloons or three balloons. But generally speaking, the maximum payload or the the weight is around 30 pounds. That's the max we can do with the balloons we got. Um, have you ever done any, so I, I'm just, just so you have a little background on why I have these balloon questions, um, our North Houston Space Society chapter, we've been thinking about doing um, a high altitude balloon as well. Okay. And um, I've done some research online by watching some video, YouTube videos and reading some articles and what have you, but it just seems like, um, we really could use a lot more uh, guidance in terms of how to go about it. Sure. Um, so uh, there's some kind of ideas that I've thought about of things that we'd like to try in the future would mm -hmm. be some type of active um, kind of uh, guidance on the way down. So instead of having to chase the balloon, be able to try to have it navigate to a particular uh, place. I okay. was wondering if, if you all had thought about doing something like that. That is interesting. I can put this idea in front of my team. We have a meeting tomorrow and I'll also even inform them about you that you are interested and at some point maybe we all should gather up or virtually of course and probably you will get some notes because they are the top experts. I'm just a helper for them but still I got so many ideas and I even launched my own payload once in 2018. But the point is that, yes, that seems like a new project, at least to me. And if that is something which is approved by the team, because they have to think about all the hardware and whatever we have, because I don't believe we have backup available for anything. So if we lose, then we lose. And that's how we, even if we have our payload somewhere in Prescott, which is like Deep Forest or in Flagstaff, we still ask the search and rescue team to see if they can help us. And that has happened in the past that we couldn't get our payload. So they went there, they got the payload. They helped us back with all the hardware, radios, transponder and everything. So that's a good question. And that's a good project, I think. Wow. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to come out there sometime after this whole COVID-19 thing's over and, and be part of the, the whole process uh, to kind of yeah. see how it works. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so what do you think about our return to the moon? Is it something you're excited about or you're, um, uh, I mean, how do you feel about it? I'm excited. I grew up thinking that I'll be an astronaut or first Indian on the moon. That's what I dreamed. I know it's very difficult. It's not easy since I'm from a different country where it's very, it's not easy to work in the US or in other countries due to space and other security regulations. But I'm, I'm hopeful in the future, probably if I can be a man like Elon Musk, then I'll just spend some money. I'll have the round trip around the moon or probably I'll be able to land. But I'm very excited. I grew up watching moon stories and all the movies in space. I think the way we are heading to our space missions is the best thing happening because if we talk about the 1960s again, it was just due to the, the space race we had back then but nowadays it's more like a competition between the private companies as well as how the government is promoting them so that's good because we need competition and over the time in four years or eight years we will be able to land humans probably we can form a colony i don't know if that's the plan but definitely i'm very excited to see if we can go back to moon as soon as possible and whenever you talk to people, you mentioned uh, there's some people that are like uh, opportunity cost and, uh, you know, we have poverty here on Earth and climate change and all these other yeah. issues and why are we going to space? When, when you talk to those uh, people that have those concerns about, you know, why are we doing this? How do you kind of approach that problem? First question I ask them is, are you actually taking care of Earth right now? Because if you don't, then you don't have to speak about anything. The only reason we, we were born to 
explore the world we were born to explore the galaxy or whatever is outside there we don't know maybe if that is if this is the approach which is going to help us in the future to avoid any unnecessary circumstances like a possible alien life or some meteor going to impact the earth and the humanity will be lost forever so we have to think of those approaches and even if the nasa and all other space agency will have an idea about this they will not share it right away because they want to think of the backup plan so whatever i'm not saying you really have to support our governments or our space agency blindly but at least have some faith in them and when they talk about the missions venus jupiter saturn then i feel i feel we should let the government do their job because that's more important and again i ask them recently i'm not going to say that it was a good thing that happened but the wildfires that are happening in the california or all over the world or the bushfire that happened in australia whose fault it was maybe nature or what about the human fault or human error we have to think of those possibilities as well and just because we have to save the earth that doesn't mean that you can just go out and destroy earth that's not possible you can even start with smallest things you can just go to a lake you can go to a mountain you can start cleaning you can ask for people to not to throw anything no no garbage please because i have see, seen these things happening as soon as the long weekend happens i will see the trash all over the place nobody wants to help nobody wants to volunteer i'm a volunteer i want to do that but then if people are not supporting me then how come they will support me in the future the same way if the government if they are not supporting the missions i don't think they will be supporting us in the future and there always be a conspiracy there will be people who will have different thoughts different opinions but that doesn't mean we have to go against them we have to respect their thoughts we have to respect their opinions but at the same time we have to tell them that why this is necessary so that's how i take my approach i tell them that what if something will happen and don't say that we will think of this in the future no we don't do that whenever we think of our retirement what we do we do our savings right now so that we don't have to work or we don't have to do unnecessary financial we don't have to take unnecessary financial burden in the future the same way we have to think about our mother earth as well let's say if something is coming towards us we have to see we have to think that how can we avoid that problem or that impact that's my answer to them um Yeah, I know. That's a very good point. I mean, back in 1969 we had uh less than half the population in the world as we do now. Uh yeah. more of that population was actually involved in uh generating food and, you know, kind of just uh living. And uh, we didn't have the internet then. Uh so you only can learn what was in the the people around you knew or what was in the local library and it's like, you know, now we should be able to be doing so many different things. You know, I mean, right. we we how much time globally is spent watching like youtube videos and if you just took like a little bit of that time and took care of problem x y z right. uh you know there's there's all the resources you need exactly um so i you know elon musk has the plan of creating a city on mars with like a million people by like 2050 Mm-hmm. and you know he he kind of has the same argument you do in terms of like backup plan and the progress he's been making with the starship in Boca Chica Texas is amazing sure. have you been following that any yes i've been following the news lately and i'm seeing the progress again i'm just curious that when they are going to do a test launch for the starship because i believe that it's going to play a huge role the falcon heavy or the bfr now is the new name, name. I think it that's the rocket which is going to take us to moon if i'm not wrong because that's the mission he announced in 2018 or probably in 2016 and they were supposed to launch in December 2018 but that didn't happen because of certain delays but yes the BFR the Falcon 9 and then the Starship i'm very curious and i'm following the news lately i'm a big follower of Elon Musk i want to meet him some day if possible or if not then I'll probably be the same like him in the future maybe a billionaire and that's when I can get his time but the thing is yes I'm following his news and uh, yes those rockets those the starship especially the new one it's pretty interesting um but uh you know Jeff Bezos he has a little different vision of blue origin in space um yeah. you know he's like you know the earth is like the best place ever uh there's no other place in the solar system that comes even close uh what we need to do is to use space to move all those earth harming activities away from earth like uh energy generation 
I mean, I think the number is like only one seven hundredth billionth of the sun's energy actually hits the earth, you know. Uh, so even if even if you created like a, a solar array that was like in the, the Trojan uh, points, you know, the what I guess the L3 and L4 uh, gravitational points, you could kind of get, you know, double, triple, quadruple the amount of energy um, yeah. that, that we get. Um, and I was just, and he thinks that what we really need to do is be creating artificial um, worlds, you know, O'Neill cylinders uh, where mm -hmm. it's completely enclosed um, kind of worlds that are, uh, you could put them wherever you want to, they could be near the earth and what have you. And I, I was wondering how, what, what you thought about those two visions, which one you thought would m more closely align with the future? I would go ahead with both the approaches because I want somebody out there who can also support Earth in a very possible way. And it's good. I would say Earth is just a family and Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, uh, whoever out there who are trying to change the world as, and as, as well as us, we are trying to do whatever we can to support our mother earth. And if Jeff Bezos is saying that we should stick to our mother earth and we should have everything around us, then that's fine by me because that way Elon Musk is thinking about some backup plan. Jeff Bezos who is the best, again, the best leader like Elon Musk is thinking about whatever we can do within the earth or around the earth. So that's actually a good approach. And about the enclosed space where we can live anywhere we want, that's a good thing because I'm a big fan of Interstellar movie as well. And that movie has gave me so many ideas. I already have certain topics in my mind so that I can present it in the next space conference. That movie told me that, yeah, yes, it is possible. It's not that difficult. If the, if again, we have to live we have to survive the humankind, then we have to look for other options. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be accepted 100%. But then again, we have to have our backup plans ready. Again, I'll keep raising the backup, backup, backup word every time. And you must have seen this over the, over this interview. Because whatever things are happening in the world right now, I'm very concerned. I'm very, very worried that why it's happening. The hurricanes, earthquakes, flooding in India and in Indonesia, the tsunami, and then the wildfires everywhere. It's not helping us. And if we don't stop, but let's take an example of this COVID-19 since we are in the pandemic right now. We, I was seeing the pictures posted by NASA that how the pollution got so down drastically that over China, India, Europe, it started feeling the or fixing the ozone layer. I said, if we can do this at least for a month or two months a year, we don't have to go out. But again, we don't know. This is on the earth. We don't know what's coming outside. If we have so many problems on earth, then just think of things out, happening outside our earth or outside our solar system. We never know what's, um, what's in our way. We never know. Yeah, it, you know, the, the backup plan option of, for a lot of people feels like we're giving up on the earth. And, you know, there's, there's some downsides to it too in the sense that regardless of how bad earth gets, um, it's, it's like harder any other place in the solar system. I mean, like on the, the moon, you have to have an enclosed container. On Mars, you'll need to have a closed container. Pretty much every place you go, you'll need to be able to have your own environment, artificial that you create. Mm -hmm. And if you're gonna create that someplace else, why couldn't you create that on the earth too as sort of the backup plan? And I was wondering what your thoughts were there. Again, I'll come to come back to my point where I was saying that we have to support the government. The government and all other top officials in the environmental and the national parks, they are taking all the efforts. But if we are not supporting them, we are not going to help for anything. So let's say Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk decided to do something on Earth. Till what extent are they going to do it? If we don't have enough support for them, I don't think it's happening. The, the problem with the humans or us is that we think the government is responsible for everything. We think we are not supposed to do anything, but that's not the thing. We, 
we have to do something from our side as well. So if I go out and I say, okay, I'm just gonna throw my trash here in this Grand Canyons, because why? Government is there, government, I'm paying $18 entry fee for Grand Canyons and then the government and then the national parks and then everybody who was responsible for this, they are going to take care of it. So why do I have to care? The same mentality, had the same mentality is there in some people they think that okay the top people the leaders and these people the government they're going to fix it but i don't have to worry so i'm just gonna do my job i'm gonna party in the in the weekend i'm gonna do a camping i'm gonna do a fire so that i can have some cooking and then they don't realize that there is a fire hazardous warning by the fire forest officials and still they will do it and that's how the new fire will start in arizona that's what happened in last three or four months. So that's how we are. So even if they do those top people, they will start doing things for Earth, it's not going to help. We will have to take a different approach. If not in an easy way, then probably in a hard way that we have to enforce rules on people that, okay, you can't go out in the forest, you can't do this, that, and then people won't like it. So it's gonna be very hard. We will not be able to convince everyone we have to go ahead and do whatever we want in order to save our earth. So that's my answer. Yeah, and that's kind of along the lines of some of my thinking. I basically think there's at least three risks that you really can't protect yourself on earth that space makes sense for. I think uh, risk number one is some type of catastrophic meteor impact. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, if, if you change earth enough from that, that could be bad. If you would want to be in multiple places to you know, one place gets hit by a, a you know, a world changing meteor. Um, it, you know, you're kind of like uh, spread out your odds a little. Uh, the second thing is this pandemic thing. Um, you know, having people that are completely hermetically separated from each other that takes, you know, five to six months to transfer between right. means that if you have a pandemic that comes out on Earth and, you know, it like spreads across the globe within a week. Uh, you know, you may not be able to recover from that, but at least you could, you know, the people who are living on Mars, uh, they don't, they're not at risk of getting that same pandemic. It's like nearly impossible. Sure. Um, and the third risk that I think is probably the most uh, uh, important reason uh, to be in another part in the solar system is risk from your fellow human, right? Uh, I mean, nuclear war, um, yeah you know, kind of, um, you know, society falling apart, things like that, um, you know, so, but can yeah. you think of any more besides those three that maybe I missed? Probably only natural and man-made things or human things, artificial things I can think of. Something else, which is outside of our scope is a black hole, which I keep thinking how this stood in the interstellar and the way we have theory on it that someday, we, some people say, or I don't know if it's an official statement or not, that our galaxy or our solar system is continuously moving. We are moving at some light year speed. So we are going to impact, or we are going to collide with some other galaxy or some other solar system. And that's how we are going to end our human race. That's what some people say. So that is also another possibility I see. Other than that, I don't know probably the end of sun someday and we don't see sunlight and all of a sudden we start this feeling that okay no more gravity no more no more sunlight and we are going to die now so just the panic but yeah panic is one another thing that even if anything happens or not the panic is definitely going to kill the humans for sure the, the moment the pandemic started we all rushed to get the toilet papers whatever food supply, water supply, and it was running out of it. So that just tells us that how we are going to handle the future scenarios or situations and the way we have this argument right now that if this pandemic was really going to kill the human race or not. So, yeah. I, I wonder what people in Japan thought about the whole toilet paper stories. <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> I got a Japanese toilet, so I'm, I'm good. <laughs> okay, got it. Um, but uh, let's see. I think, though, there's a hopeful side to space exploration, right? I mean, right. forget, even if you didn't have the backup, just the idea of having humans that were 
experiencing life and everything differently. Like, you know, uh, this concept of intellectual blind spots uh, where it's like places that you don't even know that you're, I mean, you have your known knowns, your known unknowns, your, un, uh, your unknown unknowns, you know, those types of things. So this is like your unknown unknowns, right? If you consider pretty much all of humanities had a 24 hour day, one uh, a geogravitational field, one atmosphere of pressure, to what extent has this kind of made some things invisible to us that the moment we start changing some of those things become obvious. Like whenever we start having humans who are in free space, on the moon, on Mars, on the moons of Jupiter, on the moons of Saturn, doing asteroid mining, suddenly you have human humans experiencing the universe in a very different place, observing things in very different places. I mean, I feel like that's going to trigger some kind of uh, new thinking that we can't even anticipate right now. Yeah, but it's very hard to come in how it's going to be again. And even if we see in the movies, that's how we get our ideas or inspiration from, I believe. That's how I think so, because if we talk about the Star Wars, the way that technology or the way they were showing that technology 20, 30 years or 40 years ago, it, it is there now and we made it possible. So in a similar way, whatever we, we think, impossible things or enclosed spaces, it's difficult at the moment and it's very difficult to simulate whether we will be able to survive or not. And that's a very good question to our future scientists or future researchers, that if they can come up with some kind of theory. And just to support my, my statement or to support your question, there is a place in Tucson, in Arizona only. And I forgot that place name, but it's uh, kind of- Biosphere 2? Biosphere 2, yeah, exactly. So they made the whole situation. My, 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 Oh, ham radio mentor, he was telling me about it and I didn't get a chance to visit it. But he said, Prasad, they have all the three seasons, monsoon, winter, summer, at the same time, you can see the actual desert, the forest trees, and then the beach. So you get the entire environment, the pressure, how the pressure they have stabilized. So it, it is already happening. We already tested it. And then, then the NASA, they donated that same space to University of Arizona Tucson. I believe if we, I think we are already there. The only thing is we have to make it happen. And people like again, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, they are the ones who are capable of doing it. And Christopher Nolan, the way he directs the movie, he thinks of the space and about everything, all the impossible situations. I think people like him should concentrate more on stuff like this because that's how it is going to create ideas in our minds and that's how we are going to proceed. Because if you ask me, I'm not a book reader. I don't get ideas from the books or from the articles. I watch movies and that's how I develop ideas in my mind that, okay, what if we can do this? Because the last time I saw the movie Ad Astra, I had four topics. I was writing down, I was typing it in my phone in the theater and my friend was asking, Prasad, you're not supposed to use cell phone in the theater because it's disturbing me and the others. I said, I'm so sorry. Then I turned off my phone and then next time I decided that I'm gonna buy a movie at home and I'm gonna start writing the notes because I was getting so many ideas from that movie that this is what we can do. And the same way I would say the enclosed space, impossibilities and all the impractical things we can think of that is still possible if we have the right minds and right people in it. Yeah, indeed. Um... I mean, you kind of also touched on this earlier about we each need to go out there and, and kind of make these things happen. We can't depend upon governments or upon, on, you know, like rich people and things like that. Right. What, and, you know, you, you have the kind of like the high altitude balloon project you're working on and the, the ham radio and what have you. Um, but what are some other things that we could be doing to kind of awaken people up that they can actually make these things happen. It, it feels like that, you know, you have a lot of couch potatoes and not many people out there actually making things happen. Um, right. But uh, what, what do you think it would take to change that so that everybody's going, I can make space happen? Right, that's a good question. And that should be the question for everyone, I think. Because when it comes to spreading awareness, I don't just go out and say to people, I started within myself first. And then I go and apply it to people. I want to see what they say. 
I do my personal branding all the time. If you ask me what I do, I post about my projects, my ideas, my activities all the time on Instagram stories, sometimes on Facebook, Twitter. And that's how people get to know that, okay, Prasad is into ham radio. He is into space. He is into public speaking. So whatever he is going to do, I think we have to ask him. And that's how I kind of tell the people that space is important. That's why we have to preserve the earth. That's how we can avoid certain things when we go out for camping, hiking. And that's the thing I would say, that's what I do. And one more thing, which I already touched, and I know I'm going a little bit off the topic, but whatever wildfires are happening in California or as well as in Arizona and all around the world, I already have my project in my mind. The only thing is I didn't get time, but probably by end of next year or mid year, I should be able to present it to my government officials here in Phoenix, Arizona. And if they ask me or if they ask me for more improvements, then I will be able to do it. But this is how I'm trying to help people, encourage to get into the field, into space and do certain things. So whenever I used to post about my projects on Raspberry Pi, ham radio, people were so curious. They came to me, Prasad, can you teach us? So we formed groups. I formed the Slack channel. Even if it's if there is no more activity, it's up to the people if they how much how much interested they are, and I started. I'm doing my best to encourage and to promote what I do, but it's up to the people at the end. And if they are ready to take it, I know some people, certain people, they have the potential to do whatever they want. And if they decide that okay, they want to do certain projects in Raspberry Pi, ham radio, they can still do it. But then other responsibilities, those other responsibilities, they are like worried about me, I, I am not that busy, but I'm very busy when it comes to non, non work related projects. And that's how I am in touch with everyone. So I have so many people, so many friends around me that they are interested in what I'm doing. And that's how I'm kind of telling them that, okay, this is what you can do. And I'm always into promoting them. I always encourage them because that's how I got educated when I was part of Toastmasters, the public speaking, that I know how to convince people. I know how to provide a positive feedback, positive critic, and that way it helps them. Because if suddenly I tell Nathan, no, you're not doing this. You, this, this Zoom meeting doesn't make any sense then because you're gonna interview people until 2024. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, that's what I'm gonna say, but no. I like this approach because the way you started this project, I wish I was able to do it, but no, I can't because you already started it. You have that potential. You have that excitement. You have that passion. So you can do it, but not me because I am certain, certainly different type of person. And that's why I'm gonna, I already shared it with my friends in my uh, friend circle who are from India. They liked it. They are going to subscribe or maybe they already scheduled a day. And the same way I'm gonna share it with my Ilo Mars family, the community, Space Hipsters group and everywhere, wherever possible. So that's how I like it. and. That's how I take my approach to promote and encourage people to do what they like to do and as well as to engage them in the space. Now that's, that's, uh, that sounds awesome. I mean, that's the way to go. It's about uh, taking your spark and creating a whole bunch of little sparks around you. True, yeah, exactly. Um, so if it was safe and affordable, would you go to space? Yes, definitely. Uh, how safe would it need to be? I don't care. I follow what Elon Musk said. I want to land on Mars, but not on impact the same way I want to land on moon, but not on impact. And if I want to take a loan, I'm going to take a loan or until then, I think it's going to be possible after 2025. So probably I still have five years to earn million, billion dollars one way or another. So I'm definitely going there. I don't care about the risk. I just want to be there. I want to be there in the space once in my life. I know I'm saying too many and practical things and people will make fun of me. That's fine by me, but yes, it's possible. I want to go there and um, I don't know how, but yes, definitely. I don't think they're impractical. I, I plan to be right there with you. So oh, don't, awesome. don't take away my dreams. Oh, I'll be there. Um, yeah. So is there anything that you wanted to talk about that we didn't get to? Uh, yeah, I, I probably, 
I would say, how about you ask certain questions on Mars or did you cover any questions on Mars mission when you were having these interviews with 250 plus people in the past? Because I know we talked about moon mission for now and that's the priority or that's the primary goal for now for us and I'm with you for now. But uh, what about the Mars mission? Did you think of any other challenges? Because to me, moon is very close to us than Mars. And when it comes to Mars, we have to think of our solar system and all the other things because it's like if we have one year on earth it's two years on mars and then everything else is same except the environment or the the other characteristics so did you come across any certain questions about mars that it's not possible or we shouldn't go to mars the way we have seen future missions or past missions yeah um no, I, I think uh, there's nothing to prevent us from going to Mars uh, eventually. I think the biggest problem is, um, you know, these people are going to have to completely support themselves. They, they have to be the doctor. They have to be the mechanic. Uh, they have to, um, you know, be the pilots. Of, like the, the distance is so far that you won't have all these engineers that can immediately hop onto your problem. Right. And I think that's going to be the, the biggest challenge is, uh, you know, how do you take care of these issues? And then what, what happens whenever people start having psychological problems, you know, the stress right. and the feeling of being completely isolated. You know, there's a lot of people who act completely normal and what have you uh, within a certain context, but then you take them out of that context and, you know, they really can't perform or they start behaving in, in really er erratic ways. Yeah. You know, you have to be prepared to, to do that, you know, to, to, to handle that situation and they'll have to handle it on their own. You know, sure. I mean, they won't be able to send that uh, person back to Earth. They have to keep that person with them throughout the mission and hopefully rehabilitate them at some point so that they can continue. So I, I think um, I think those are the real challenges. But, you know, we've had uh, I mean, like Ernest Shackleton, uh, for example, and, the uh, you know, uh, the, the that British mission to go across Antarctica back in like the late 1800s or early 1900s. Mm -hmm. I think it's the early 1900s um, because I think it was right at the beginning of either World War One or World War Two. I think World War One it was um, because there weren't planes. And uh, anyway, they're completely out of touch with humanity for like an entire year, and they're having to survive on their own. You know, yeah. like uh, and you know, so I mean, we have people that that have been able to do that. I, I think um, I think we could go to we could go to Mars. Yeah, but I haven't yeah. talked about it much. Um, pretty much the the only conversations I have have been, um, you know, Elon has this plan of creating a city on Mars. You know, that's that's as yeah. much as I've talked. Right. And I really like, like, I'm not going to be a political person here, but I want to highlight something with the current, what's, what the current government or current uh, leadership said that we should prioritize the moon mission first because that's a good step towards Mars mission. And we will be able to come across certain challenges on moon whenever we are going to moon and back. And we will be able to see, we will be able to document everything because yesterday I saw a video on Facebook about the discovery mission. And uh, it was like, definitely it was a different feeling for me, the way we, we did the missions in the past. We are changing now and all the prototypes are changing. Mm. It's like the way we move into the future, all the hardware and everything, the Moore's law, it's going to be very small and we will be able to do more with the smallest hardware possible. And then the technology, the research in all the schools and universities is going great. So this will definitely help in 2024, 2025. And uh, that's what I was thinking. And then one more thing I would say that if, I know you will be able to have this posted or presented four years from now, five years from now, but I'm also preparing, I'm preparing by myself for all the expedition missions. I'm sure you know about this, but in the ham radio community as well, there, there are certain groups or there are certain people from all over the world or especially US, they go to a place which is not easy to go. So let me tell you this Antarctica mission. 
once this group they went to antarctica obviously with the help of certain people teams and us military or navy and uh, they had their base on one of the islands or one of the places from there they installed all the radios and all the antennas and they were talking to people all all around the world or especially in that hemisphere what they were doing is as part of their plan or as part of their mission they were doing trainings for two years non-stop two years i think of the same way the moment we announced the nasa graduates for the future missions they were already having certain trainings going on and they will be trained for next four years that's what i saw in the news and that's how we need to prepare and that's how i'm going to like at least try from my side i'm doing all the hiking things possible i'm trying to follow the protocol that if i'm in a situation where i don't have any support what i'm going to do what am i supposed to do the same way i want to practice more about the expedition because the expedition is something which lasts for months or years and that's very important because that's how it's going to help you understand how are you or how are you going to support yourself in those type of situation pandemic already proved me that i cannot be at home all the time so that's one more thing i want to think that how i'm going to help myself in certain situations like this i'm already prepared now but then it's not necessary that i'm going to be surviving in the enclosed environment where i don't get to go out i just have to spend my time within a room or within a place or a mansion or house on earth on mars or moon and then i don't have anybody to talk other than my teammates who will be across the other room it's going to be challenging and we will have to find a way and i'm sure nasa is already working on it not just nasa but all the other space agencies no there is that uh, group mars 1 uh, a few years back who uh, said that thousands of people around the world uh, wanted to sign up for a one way ticket to mars I I wonder how many of those people after this pandemic and being locked in their house for many months are going, you know, I don't think I can really handle staying in a capsule that long. <laughs> They should do another survey on the same people then. Are you still interested? We have our rocket ready. That's what they should do. Oh, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Well, um any suggestions for me on how to kind of improve my process, uh the interview or uh the sign up process or anything like that no i don't think i you need any suggestion because i feel like you thought about every single tiny thing the only thing is i will say i totally forgot about, about your interview which was today and i started my job yesterday so i was like whether i'll be able to attend your call or not but i thought okay this is the only opportunity for me to talk about space to somebody who likes space and probably maybe you can send a, an email reminder a week before or something that's the only thing i can say because i totally forgot and then i checked all my calendars i missed one of the conferences from last week that was different thing but i was very i was sad that i missed it and then i saw your email and then i was like okay fine i'm going to make it to this meeting if late that's fine but i want to still be here so that's the only thing the future the question structure the way you asked all the question the way you have knowledge and notes about everything that's simply great and i still remember we were on that conference in that conference in texas and that's for how we got connected on linkedin because i was presenting on the solar conjunction situation and uh, that is one of the reasons i was presenting on the similar situation to mars so that we can support future human missions but yes whatever you did so far it's great my friends love the idea again the only thing is it's about the people and their priorities if they like space if they love space they will definitely come for your interview and after this call uh, maybe i'll say if you could share me your message which you shared on linkedin a few days ago or weeks ago i want to share it in the space hipsters i don't know if you're part of that group or not but it's a big group very good space community at the same time i'm going to post it on our i love mars page and i'll ask my friends bill and ron because ron recently did interview with elon musk and probably he will have more to talk about on the space missions or uh, the the starship missions so that's what i'm going to do so nathan kudos to you you're doing amazing job i will do my best to share your process or the interview or registration link with unlimited amount of people i have whatsapp so i have so many friends there as well so if you are interested i'll just do my best to share it with all the communities if possible 
Yeah, that'd be fantastic. I have uh, more than 1500 days to get through and okay. I don't have that many friends yet, so. <laughs> okay, no, trust me, after I share the link, you will, you should be able to see more people. And even if it's only shared on Space Sisters, I'll still do it again and possibly we will see more signups or more interviews. That'd be awesome. Well, I really appreciate your time and um, I, I thank you so much. I look forward to talking to uh, uh, all the people that that you could get me in touch with. Awesome. It was my pleasure, Nathan, and thanks to you. Well, uh, you have a good day then. Have a good day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.